Good morning. Uh, on behalf of Jake's dissertation committee members, including Jean Morse, who's here from UB School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences, and then remotely Lucia Leone in our department, Community Health and Health Behavior, as well as Dr. Yu Lu, who's at the University of Rochester Medical Center. I'm pleased to welcome you to the dissertation defense of Jake Bleasdale. Uh, a member of the UB Honors College as an undergraduate student, Jake majored in uh, biomedical sciences, completing his bachelor's of science degree, and couldn't do only one minor, but decided to do two in pharmacology and toxicology, as well as the newly developed public health minor, graduating in 2019. Sorry, yeah, 2019. Yep. <laughs> he also graduated uh, uh, summa cum laude. Jake received the 2019 SUNY Chancellor's Award for Student Excellence, which is the most prestigious SUNY level student award available in the SUNY institutions. As a UB Presidential Fellow, Jake began his doctoral training here in our department in August of 2019. He has an impressive 18 peer-reviewed publications, five of which are first author. In addition, he has more than two dozen regional, national, and international conference presentations, including the International Aid Society, as well as the American Public Health Association. As a PhD student, he's also received numerous awards that I can't, I don't have enough time to list for both his academic successes as well as his commitment to the public health profession. I respectfully ask that you hold your questions until the end of Jake's talk. Please join me in welcoming Jake for his uh, presentation. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah Mona, for that wonderful introduction. And first of all, just thank you all for being here today. My talk today is going to focus on a mixed methods approach to understanding the role of food insecurity in the HIV care continuum. To start, I'm gonna give a brief background about HIV and food insecurity in the United States, explain how food insecurity has impact people living with HIV. I'll briefly touch on my conceptual models and theoretical frameworks that are guiding this body of dissertation work before going into my study aims and then talking through each three of my studies and subsequent manuscripts. I'll then end today with general conclusions about public health implications and directions for future work as well. So while the number of new HIV infections in the United States has decreased significantly since the height of the epidemic in the 1980s, HIV still prevails as a significant public health concern. In 2020, the CDC estimated approximately 31,000 new HIV infections um, and while this is indicative of a 17% reduction from 2019, this is likely the result of the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on HIV testing, treatment, and services as well. In 2020, there were also approximately 1.1 million people living with HIV in the United States. And despite overall strides to increase treatment and prevention efforts, HIV still disproportionately impacts certain aspects of the population, and we see significant disparities across age, race, and sexual identity. And while we have made great improvements, more work is needed to reduce the number of people infected with HIV and to also increase quality of life among those living with the virus. And in order to accelerate these HIV prevention efforts, in 2019, the United States developed what is known as the Ending the Epidemic Initiative, which seeks to reduce the number of new HIV infections in the United States by 90% in 2030. And one key strategy of this initiative is to treat people with HIV rapidly and effectively to reach viral suppression, which means that a person infected with HIV can no longer sexually transmit the virus to an uninfected person. However, helping people reach and sustain viral suppression requires optimizing engagement in what is known as the HIV care continuum. So the HIV care continuum is a public health framework that depicts individual and population level stages of HIV care. In essence, this framework describes the stages that people living with HIV go through to become virally suppressed. The continuum includes five stages. These include diagnosis with HIV, linkage to HIV care, receipt of that HIV care, and retention and care, and ultimately timely progression throughout the continuum will help people living with HIV achieve and maintain the fifth step of the continuum known as viral suppression. So while current national uh, estimates to increase the number of people living with HIV who are virus suppressed to 90%, we see that national estimates fall short of those targets. So according to the CDC in 2020, 
More than 80% of people living with HIV were linked to care within one month of diagnosis. 74% were uh, received at least one as aspect of care. 51% were retained in care and 65% successfully attained viral suppression. And in order to attain these nas national targets to end the HIV epidemic by 2030, we must have a greater understanding of the individual, societal, and structural mechanisms that impede successful engagement for people living with HIV. And there's an abundant amount of literature that illustrates strong population level associations between socioeconomic status and HIV outcomes. So resource poor environments are heavily affected by HIV as they shoulder a significant burden of not only incidents, but also prevalent cases of HIV at the community level. These environments typically endure several structural and socioeconomic barriers, such as high unemployment rates, low medium household incomes, unstable housing, and food insecurity, which have the potential to impact successful engagement and care for those living with HIV. And one potential mechanism that influences HIV care engagement is food insecurity. According to the United States Department of Agriculture, food insecurity is defined as lacking consistent access to nutritionally adequate foods due to limited resources or the inability to attain foods in socially acceptable ways. And there are significant health implications of food insecurity that span the physiologic, psychologic, and nutritional dimensions. For instance, among adults, food insecurity has been associated with malnutrition, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and mental health concerns such as depression and anxiety. And while the prevalence of food insecurity has remained relatively stable within the past two decades, we can see that there is a slight decrease in the prevalence rates of food insecurities for US households within the past decade. Um, so this graph here shows the percentage of households that are food insecure from 20, 2001 to 2021. You can see that that prevalence rate has remained stable, but within the past decade from 2011 to 2021, we have seen a, a slight decrease in the prevalence rates. However, there's a different story for people living with HIV. So while the overall prevalence rates of food insecurity have relatively decreased, food insecurity has been shown to disproportionately impact people living with HIV. So these cross-sectional data suggest that approximately 24 to 60% of people living with HIV residing in the United States were food insecure, compared to only about 10% of US households in 2021. We also see that food insecurity significantly affects people living with HIV, and we see significant effects on HIV outcomes and treatment engagement. For instance, a recent systematic review found that among people living with HIV who are food insecure, there was approximately 29% lower odds of viral suppression compared to their food secure counterparts. And we also see that this affects optimal art adherence and treatment engagement as well. A recent study out of Atlanta, Georgia, found that people living with HIV who are food insecure had approximately 32% lower odds of optimal ART adherence or adherence to HIV medications compared to food secure people living with HIV. And we also see that the effects of food insecurity expand beyond HIV clinical outcomes to include worse cognitive, physical, and mental health concerns. Among a sample of people living with HIV in Miami, Florida, we saw four times higher odds of cognitive impairment compared to food secure counterparts, and approximately twofold higher risk of depression among people who are living with HIV who are food insecure compared to those who were food secure. So despite this robust body of literature that demonstrates an association between food insecurity and various HIV-related outcomes, gaps in the literature still remain. First, there's limited qualitative research that has explored the influence of the COVID-19 pandemic on various socio and structural determinants such as food insecurity and their potential impacts on HIV care engagement. And second, most of the work examining food insecurity within the context of HIV has really emphasized that last stage of the HIV care continuum, viral suppression. And despite the importance of achieving and maintaining viral suppression uh, for disease progression and transmission, Proper engagement and other steps of the care continuum, such as receipt and care and retention and care, are very vital in order to reach ending the epidemic initiatives. Therefore, the influence of food insecurity on multiple stages of the care continuum remains unknown. Further, there's limited research that has investigated the potential mechanisms that link food insecurity with multiple stages of the care continuum. 
Knowledge of these specific mechanisms has the potential to influence the development of clinically relevant interventions that could be designed and targeted to the intended outcome. And lastly, there's limited work that explores HIV healthcare and social service providers' perspectives on navigating food insecurity and HIV care. And in order to implement clinic-based interventions, it's really important that we begin to understand stakeholders' perspectives on the barriers and facilitators to integrating food insecurity interventions in real time. So to understand and address these gaps, there were several conceptual models and frameworks that helped to guide this body of dissertation research. My first is the HIV care continuum, which served as a conceptual model for understanding HIV care engagement. For this dissertation, I focused on the last three stages of the care continuum, receipt of care, retention and care, and viral suppression, given their significant associations with positive HIV-related outcomes. Second, to understand the relationships between food insecurity and the HIV care continuum, my second conceptual model is the bi-directional links between food insecurity and HIV AIDS, which was developed by Weisers and colleagues out of the University of California at San Francisco. This framework illustrates a bi-directional relationship between food insecurity and HIV morbidity and mortality, and it theorizes that food insecurity influences HIV-related outcomes, such as CD4 cell count and viral suppression, through behavioral, mental health, and nutritional mechanisms. For instance, food insecurity influences behavioral uh, mechanisms through art non-adherence, mistreatment appointments, and interruptions. For mental health, food insecurity exacerbates anxiety, depression, and substance use. And for nutritional mechanisms, we see food and medication interactions, poor diet quality, and increased or lower body mass index, which all have been shown to significantly uh, affect viral suppression and CD4 cell counts. For my dissertation, I adapted this framework to theorize that food insecurity would influence HIV care continuum outcomes, that is receipt of care, retention in care, and viral suppression through similar behavioral, mental health, and nutritional pathways. So the extension of this framework to include the HIV care continuum allows us to gain a greater understanding about how food insecurity influences not only individual, but also population level outcomes of HIV care. And lastly, the social ecological model contextualized this body of work to provide ecological inferences. The social ecological model is a public health framework that describes individual health behaviors within the context of a larger social system. And this model allows researchers to understand the dynamic relationships between a person and their environment and how these relationships influence health. For the context of this dissertation, a four-level social ecological model was used to contextualize the delivery of HIV care within a clinical setting. And these levels included the patient, provider, clinic, and community levels. So overall, the purpose of this dissertation work was to extend the current body of literature by exploring the relationships between food insecurity and HIV care continuum outcomes. The collections of work use mixed methods to understand ecological associations between sociostructural factors and HIV care engagement within the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, to examine various biopsychosocial pathways linking food insecurity to HIV care continuum outcomes, and lastly, to understand barriers and facilitators to mitigating food insecurity in HIV care among HIV healthcare and social service providers. I'd like to walk through each of my manuscripts that kind of contextualize this body of work. My first manuscript, which has been published in Tropical Medicine and Infectious Disease, sought to understand the ways in which socio-structural factors influence HIV care engagement among people living with HIV within the context of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. The specific aims of study one were to one, understand how various socio-structural factors impacted treatment engagement for people living with HIV, two, explore the relationships between food insecurity and treatment engagement, and lastly, to identify barriers and facilitators to optimal treatment engagement as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. So from January to October of 2021, I conducted qualitative interviews with 25 people living with HIV to understand various factors that influenced their care engagement during the COVID-19 pandemic. Participants were eligible to complete an interview if they were 18 years of age or older, English speaking, living with HIV, prescribed ART or HIV medications for at least 30 days, and had been receiving or are currently receiving food assistance in the last 30 days. And for this dissertation and all studies moving forward, we defined food assistance as receiving supplemental nutrition assistance program or SNAP benefits 
or visiting a food pantry or food bank within the past 30 days. My interviews included a detailed discussion about how housing, income, food access, and the COVID-19 pandemic have impacted their HIV care engagement, and all participants did receive a $40 Amazon gift card upon completion of their interview. For my data analysis, I conducted a thematic content analysis to report semantic level themes describing HIV care engagement following an integrative, inductive, deductive approach. A final cross analysis was then performed to identify themes by focusing on codes related to social determinants, care engagement, and COVID-19 impacts. And the rigor and trustworthiness of the data were assessed throughout both the data collection process and the analytic phase as well. So of the 25 participants in this study, the average age was approximately 40 years old, and the majority identified as male and Black or African American, and nearly one-third of the sample had a high school education or less. More than three-quarters of the sample was unemployed at the time of their interview, more than two-thirds reported stable housing, and more than half reported food insecurity, with approximately 64% self-reporting viral suppression. So thematic analysis revealed three themes that either supported or hindered care engagement within the context of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. These included social determinants of health, social support, and modes of healthcare delivery. And I'll go into more detail about these themes and the secondary themes in subsequent slides. So the first secondary theme of social determinants of health was unstable income. Most participants discussed how economic stressors, such as being unemployed as a result of the pandemic, limited their HIV care engagement. Periods of income instability often took precedent over participants' HIV care, as the pandemic heightened concerns about affording everyday necessities, such as food, water, and made attending their HIV appointments less of a priority. Second, inadequate housing was a prevalent secondary theme of social determinants. And while more than two thirds of participants reported stable income, participants described how the pandemic contributed to inadequate and unsafe housing. This was a prevalent factor that not only influenced our adherence for most participants, but at times lacking stable and secure housing influenced pro prolonged treatment engagement. The second, the final secondary theme of social determinants was food insecurity. And the majority of participants discussed how experiencing food insecurity was a consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic, which led to the erosion of their mental and physical well-being. Many participants described how these feelings led to disruptions in care, reduced motivations to take their HIV medications, and also discouraged uh, clinic, HIV clinic attendance as well. However, our results also illustrated the importance of social support as a primary theme. Many participants described receiving emotional and instrumental support from family and friends, which was found to promote care engagement. Participants often recounted instances where loved ones provide financial and transportation support during the COVID-19 pandemic, which had impeded such needs. And this was found to not only necessitate medication adherence, but also appointment attendance as well. And we see a similar uh, theme when we look at uh, receiving emotional and informational support from clinicians, case managers, care coordinators, and counselors as well. Clinicians and social service providers encourage participants to remain adherent to their medications and also keep up with their appointments. And the last theme was modes of healthcare delivery, and participants described how the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic influenced their various modes of healthcare. These concerns commonly arose from fears and worries about contracting the COVID-19 virus or SARS-CoV-2, and participants described skipping their, their in-person HIV appointments to hopefully mitigate potential exposures. And concerns surrounding COVID-19 were not only motivated by contracting the virus, but also by its potential effects among people who had pre-existing medical conditions such as HIV. This fear prevented participants from attending their clinic appointments, which often led to prolonged treatment uh, interruptions. And lastly, many described how the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic transitioned care to telehealth or virtual appointments. These experiences were often mixed, as participants have recounted both positive and negative sentiments. So as you can see, some participants viewed telehealth positively because it allowed for flexibility, Yet other participants disagreed, citing that telehealth limited their engagement with their clinician and that the level of care they required would not be attainable through a screen. 
So overall, Manuscript One employed qualitative methods to understand the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on HIV care engagement through its influence on various socio-structural factors. Our results highlight the importance of social determinants of health in HIV care, and the need to properly address these factors to promote successful engagement along the HIV care continuum. And as you may recall, a prominent theme that came out of paper one was uh, social determinants and food insecurity. Many of the participants described how food insecurity led to the erosion of their mental and nutritional health. It slowly put them into a depressive state. They weren't sure if they were gonna get a balanced diet. And this was found to not only reduce motivation for medication adherence, but also discourage HIV clinic engagement. And these results uh, from manuscript one informed my second study and subsequent manuscript that is currently under review at Frontiers in Public Health, which sought to quantitatively examine the impact of food insecurity and HIV con care continuum outcomes, and to understand the mediating roles of various behavioral, mental health, and nutritional pathways. So my two research questions from manuscript two sought to answer uh, were, does food insecurity influence the HIV steps in the HIV care continuum, such as receipt of care, retention in care, and viral suppression? And do behavioral, mental health, and nutritional pathways mediate these associations between food insecurity and HIV care continuum outcomes? I hypothesized that food insecurity would, sig would be significantly associated with receipt of care retention and care and viral suppression, and that behavioral mental health and nutritional mechanisms would mediate the relation between food insecurity and aforementioned care continuum outcomes. So in order to address these hypotheses and these research questions, from May to August of 2022, I conducted a web-based cross-sectional study of a sample of people living with HIV in New York State, and participants were eligible to complete the survey if they were, again, 18 years of age or older, English speaking, living with HIV, residing in New York State, had been prescribed art medication or HIV medication in the past 30 days, and had received food assistance in the past 30 days. I ended up collecting anonymous self-report information regarding participants' demographic characteristics, food insecurity status, HIV care continuum outcomes, and various behavioral, mental health, and nutritional characteristics, and all participants received a $15 Amazon e-gift card for completing the survey. So as stated, some social de sociodemographic characteristics included a wide variety of um, items. These included age, race, gender, housing status, amongst others. My primary exposure variable was past month food insecurity, which was measured using the U.S. Household Food Security Survey module, which was then scored on a continuous scale from 0 to 10, where higher scores indicated increasing severity of food insecurity. My primary outcome variables were three stages in the HIV care continuum, that being receipt of care, retention in care, and viral suppression, as defined by the CDC. I also collected various data on HIV-related behavioral characteristics, such as missed HIV clinic visits and art medication adherence, mental health measures, including depression, anxiety, perceived stress, and illicit substance use, and for the nutritional characteristics, I asked participants to record their height and weight, which then I used to calculate body mass index. And to test research question one, I conducted individual multivariable logistic regression models to estimate the adjusted odds ratios and 95% confidence intervals for the associations between food insecurity and non-receipt of care, non-retention in care, and viral non-suppression adjusting for age, race, ethnicity, education, income, and marital status. To examine research question two, I conducted individual causal mediation analyses with 1,000 bootstrap replications to determine whether behavioral, mental health, and nutritional mechanisms mediated the relationships between food insecurity and two stages of the HIV care continuum outcome, uh, non-retention in care and viral non-suppression, and for each of my models, I selected the strongest mediator along each path. I must note that we didn't conduct causal mediation analyses for the outcome non received in care because of the non significant association between food insecurity and received in care, which was largely due to the large affirmative response rate, but I'll talk about that in, in a little bit in more detail. So after examining each potential mediator for each of our paths, our behavioral, mental health, and nutritional, Optimal art adherence, depression, and BMI were the strongest mediators for the behavioral, mental health, and nutritional pathways, respectively, for both non-retention in care and viral non-suppression. 
Of the 200 people living with HIV in our study, the mean age was approximately 31 years old, and the majority identified as male, Black, and heterosexual. As you can see, more than three quarters of my sample was unemployed at the time of taking the survey. More than two thirds reported unstable housing. More than half reported an income less than $10,000 and about 20% had a high school education or less. For my exposure variables, the median score in the household food security survey module was a nine, which corresponds to very high food insecurity. And among my outcome variables, 94% reported receiving care, 72% reported retention in care, and 51% self-reported viral suppression. And adjusted models uh, results indicated that increasing severity of food insecurity was associated with approximately 1.35 greater odds of non-retention in care compared to participants with less severe food insecurity. Similarly, we can see that increasing in food insecurity was associated with approximately 1.3 higher odds of viral non-suppression, and there was no significant association between food insecurity and non receiving care, likely because most of the sample, about 94%, reported uh, receiving care at the time of taking the survey. So I'm going to walk through each of the significant mediation analyses for each path and its respective outcome. So for the relationship between food insecurity and non-retention and care, causal mediation analyses illustrated an indirect relationship of food insecurity on non-retention and care that was mediated approximately 30% through BMI. And for both the behavioral and mental health paths, there was no evidence of an indirect relationship of food insecurity on non-retention uh, non and care that was mediated by either optimal art adherence or depression. And we see a similar story for the nutritional pathways and viral non-suppression. So like non-retention and care, there was an indirect relationship of food insecurity and viral non-suppression that was mediated approximately 27% through BMI. And again, there was no evidence of an indirect relationship of food insecurity and viral non-suppression uh, mediated by the behavioral pathway. However, unlike non-retention in care, there was a significant indirect relationship between food insecurity and non viral non-suppression that was mediated 100% through depression. So results from study two showed that food insecurity was asso significantly associated with worse HIV care continuum outcomes, and that both nutritional and mental health mechanisms may play a role in mitigating those effects. However, the extent to which these mechanisms may explain engagement in care is really dependent on the intended outcome. And given that these mechanisms have the potential to serve as clinically relevant points of intervention, my third and final dissertation study and manuscript, which is currently under review at AIDS Care, sought to understand key stakeholders' perspectives on addressing food insecurity in HIV care. Manuscript three sought to answer three aims, the first being exploring attitudes and beliefs regarding the role of food insecurity and nutrition in stages of the care continuum among HIV healthcare and social service providers, to identify barriers and facilitators to addressing, HIV, to addressing food insecurity in HIV care, and lastly, to identify potential solutions to addressing food insecurity among people living with HIV. So to address these aims, uh, from August to September of 2022, I conducted semi-structured interviews with a convenient sample of healthcare and social service providers across New York State. Interest pers interested persons were eligible to participate if they were 18 years of age or older, English speaking, identified as a healthcare or social service provider, and had been working with people living with HIV for about three months. For this study, we uh, operationalized a healthcare provider is anyone who provides direct medical care to people living with HIV. So that could be a physician, a physician's assistant, pharmacist, LPN, RN, and a social service provider as people who help link people living with HIV to social services. So that would be social workers, community health workers, health educators, and retention specialists. These interviews included a detailed discussion about the importance of food and nutrition in routine HIV care, and barriers and facilitators to addressing food insecurity among people living with HIV within the clinic. And all participants received a $50 Amazon gift card for their participation. So like Manuscript 1, I performed a thematic content analysis that followed an inductive deductive approach to report semantic level themes that were regarding barriers and facilitators to addressing food insecurity in HIV care. A final cross analysis was then conducted 
um, to identify themes across the patient, provider, clinical, and community levels of the social ecological model through observed patterns in the qualitative data. And again, the rigor and trustworthiness of the data were assessed during both the data collection and analytic phases. So of the 18 participants in my study, the average age was approximately 40 years old. The majority identified as white, female, and straight or heterosexual. Four participants identified as a healthcare provider and 14 identified as a social service provider. And the majority reported working at a community health center. And nearly all participants had experiences discussing food and nutrition related concerns with, their pe with people living with HIV in the past three months. My thematic analysis highlighted eight themes that illustrated six barriers and two facilitators to addressing food insecurity in HIV care across various levels of the social ecological model. And we'll go by each level of the, of the model for the results. So first at the patient level, providers perceived embarrassment, shame, and judgment as a barrier to influencing their ability to address food insecurity in routine care. Most providers shared that many people living with HIV were often reluctant to share their food-related concerns and were often dishonest about their needs. This dishonesty was typically rooted in fears of judgment as patients were ashamed of not having enough food to eat and feared that their provider would judge them for that. Similarly, providers perceived low health literacy and limited nutritional knowledge as a patient-level challenge. Most providers discussed that disease management is often the highest priority for people living with HIV, yet the importance of nutrition in that process is frequently overlooked, and thus hinders their ability to address it in real time within the clinical setting. Now at the provider level, participants discussed lacking time as a large barrier to addressing food insecurity for people living with HIV. Almost unanimously, providers described that brief medical appointments required them to prioritize medical concerns over social concerns, such as food insecurity. However, a facilitator at the provider level were strong patient-provider relationships. Building and maintaining these relationships allowed patients to feel comfortable disclosing their food-related concerns with providers, and this was also found to have reciprocal and mutually reinforcing benefits, which not only assisted in their comfort to address these concerns with their patients, but assist in their ability to physically address them in real time. At the clinic level, providers frequently discussed how limited funding and bureaucratic requirements attached to funding sources hindered their ability to address food insecurity. For example, the lack of financial resources was a commonly reported barrier to not only maintaining and bolstering currently existing food programs at clinics, but also establishing new or advanced uh, food insecurity programs at clinics or at clinics who did not have food programs at all. Yet we did find that on-site resources were an important facilitator to mitigating patients' food insecurity concerns at the clinic level. Clinic-based programs such as food pantries and food banks help to address food insecurity concerns in real time. And providers described how patients often felt a sense of relief knowing that they could receive food from the same place that they received their HIV care. And at the community level, there were two prevalent barriers that impeded providers' abilities to address food insecurity. The first uh, being community norms and intersecting stigmas. Providers described the ways in which community norms towards people living with HIV and also towards people who receive food assistance created intersecting stigmas that served as challenges to ameliorating food insecurity for their patients. Providers noted that HIV stigma is still very prevalent in many communities, and this contributes to patients' reluctance to not only discuss it with their providers, but to also go out into the community and receive and accept assistance. Second, limited access to healthy foods was a prevalent community-level barrier to addressing food insecurity. Providers described how influential factors such as sociostructural determinants contributed to the development of neighborhoods with limited access to healthy food. This factors often made it difficult for providers to intervene for their patients and limited their ability to address their patients' concerns in real time. So study three highlighted several barriers and facilitators to effectively addressing food insecurity in HIV care that spanned the patient, provider, clinic and community levels. These results illustrated that both healthcare and social service providers acknowledged the importance of addressing their patients' food and nutrition-related concerns, 
and suggest the needs for multi-level interventions that account for not only the perspectives of people living with HIV, but also the pers perspectives of providers as well. Now I'd just like to transition to some general conclusions about the public health implications of this work and directions for future research. So first, my three dissertation studies highlighted the importance of food security in HIV care. Both food insecurity and HIV care are complex and dynamic processes that, influenced are, that are influenced by individual, social, and structural phenomena. My studies identified that safe and reliable access to affordable, nutritious food is an important social determinant of health and of HIV care. And these results also support international and national organizations that have identified the importance of integrating food and nutrition into HIV care. However, my studies also identified that there are prevailing negative effects of food insecurity. Our results illustrated that food insecurity is a basic material need that when not adequately addressed, takes precedent over HIV care. For example, participants in manuscript one described how food insecurity led to the erosion of their physical and mental well-being, which not only impacted medication adherence, but also treatment engagement. Manuscript two highlighted significant associations between food insecurity and HIV uh, care continuum outcomes, such as retention care and viral suppression. And lastly, providers in Manuscript 3 recognized and identified several barriers to addressing food insecurity within the clinical setting. And taken together, these three dissertation studies highlight the intersection, intersecting and reinforcing relationships between food insecurity and HIV care and suggest the need for more scientific inquiry and also intervention implementation and bolstering in order to have meaningful public health impacts. And one potential solution to addressing food insecurity within HIV care is the integration and bolstering of current food as medicine programs within HIV care. So for those who aren't aware, food as medicine framework describes the healthcare and population health interventions that seek to address nutritional and food needs of various patient populations. These include tailored meals delivered directly to patients, pre-selected foods provided in combination with nutrition and food preparation education, discounted or free fresh produce, and government nutrition security programs, such as healthcare screening programs. And all of these interventions have shown initial efficacy at improving food insecurity among participants in other clinical settings, such as hospitals and primary cares. Yet the implications and investigations of these interventions have yet to occur within the HIV realm. And the introduction and amplification of food as medicine programs in HIV care has several key public health implications. So first, the integration of services that address social determinants of health aligned with national and international declarations calling for the incorporation of food and nutrition programs into routine HIV care. Second, the integration of food insecurity programs into routine care has the potential to remove significant barriers that people living with HIV commonly experience when receiving social services. And lastly, the integration of these services has the potential to address the social and medical needs of people living with HIV in tandem. So this approach may not only reduce food insecurity, but also may increase HIV care engagement, thereby supporting strategies to end the HIV ep epidemic in the United States. I'd like to talk about some uh, directions for future research as well. Um, an important area for our future research is the use of longitudinal study designs and robust methodology to examine these complex and interrelated relationships that link food insecurity to worse HIV outcomes. For instance, the use of real-time measurement tools such as ecological momentary ass uh, assessment to capture daily aspects of food insecurity, medication adherence, mental health concerns, and nutritional intake may assist with understanding these complex and nuanced relationships. In addition, the use of more uh, robust and gold standard measurements for nutritional intake, such as remote, remote food photography, which is, uses real-time pictures to capture plan and actual uh, food consumption to provide not only estimates of energy consumption, but of nutrient intake, may help us to better understand the nutritional mechanisms that link food insecurity and HIV care continuum outcomes. And another area for future work is the systematic exploration of the intersecting and compounding effects of multiple basic needs, not only on HIV treatment outcomes, but on HIV prevention as well. 
Results from my dissertation suggest that people living with HIV do not experience material need insecurities such as food, income, housing, and healthcare alone. Uh, manuscript one highlighted the influence of inadequate food, housing, and income on HIV care engagement. And other quantitative work have identified independent associations between each of these insecurities and eight worse HIV outcomes. So this dissertation work really highlights the need for future work that examines the combined effects of these insecurities on not only re related clinical outcomes, but care continuum outcomes as well. And I am actually excited to announce that I will be continuing this line of work during my postdoctoral fellowship at the Southern HIV and Alcohol Research Consortium at the University of Florida, where I'll be looking at the collective role of material need insecurities on HIV prevention and treatment outcomes, primarily among Black sexual minority men. And I'd just like to uh, take time today to end my talk by acknowledging the people who have made both this dissertation and PhD life possible. Um, first, for Sarah Mona, for those who don't know, I met Sarah Mona during my sophomore year of undergrad at UB. She taught my first public health course. Um, and I went up to her right after class and was like, I want to work with you. And I am very glad that 19-year-old me was very so direct and dedicated to work with you. Um, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for your kindness and support. You have provided me with a positive and welcoming environment that has always encouraged creativity and inquiry. And I'm convinced that without your support, I would be on a very different and arguably less rewarding academic and career path. To the rest of my committee, Dr. Lucia Leone, Dr. Yu Liu, and Dr. Jean Morse, thank you all for your mentorship throughout this dissertation. Your thoughtful suggestions not only have made this work better, but have undoubtedly made me a better scientist. To the, oh, goodness, to the staff and, the, and faculty in the Department of Community Health and Health Behavior, thank you for always being so supportive with your open door policies and for our chit chats in the kitchen. I really am going to miss working in such a supportive environment. To the Prisbilla lab members and graduate students that are near and far, thank you for providing me with such a wonderful work environment to work in these past four years and for supporting me with these projects. To my friends and extended family, um, particularly my revolution friends, thank you so much for, for, for providing me with a space outside of academia to be myself. Very hard to find spaces where you can turn your brain off and not think about things, and I'm very thankful I found a supportive environment. And I must make a special call out to my uh, dear friend and colleague, the future Dr. Kate Rogers, for always supporting me in my future endeavors and for keeping me grounded throughout this process. And lastly, to my mom, dad, and my brother, Josh, thank you guys so much for enduring um, me through my eight-year educational journey, for letting me scatter the house with thousands and thousands of flashcards, and for always being so understanding when I would say I would have to study. Your unending support has meant the world to me. And lastly, I do have to give a shout out to my cat, Cleo, who has <laughs> literally become a star in every Zoom class that I have taken during the pandemic, and has heard this talk so many times she probably deserves an honorary doctorate. And lastly, like me, has gained a newfound love for the infamous gentle introduction to Stata Guide. <laughs> lastly, I would just like to acknowledge my funding agencies, which include the Graduate Student Association, Mark Diamond Research Fund, the Department of Community Health and Health Behavior, and Embrace Western New York. And I'd be admiss if I did not thank my community partners. These include Evergreen Health, the Pride Center of Western New York, New York State Department of Health, Embrace Western New York, and Trillium Health. HIV treatment and prevention in New York State is not possible without these amazing community organizations and I'm forever grateful for their partnerships to conduct this dissertation work. And on that note, I would like to thank you all so much for being here today and open it up to any questions. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. Yes, yeah, stop. Great job, Jake. Thanks. Um, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about the mediational model with BMI in it. Like, what about BMI do you think would be predictive of engagement in HIV care? Yeah, so it's really down to like more like the physiological, so like the lipodystrophy affecting medication, um, like uptake at the like the pharmacokinetic biological level. Um, so the models have really predict that. Higher BMI doesn't allow for us uh, like more optimal processing of the medication. But I'll, of the studies that have looked at BMI as like a nutritional mechanism, like no one has looked at like art and food interactions or like really dived into like the nutritional intake. 
which is, I think, a major lacking area for like this line of work, especially when we're looking at nutritional. Because I would, I would, I would be, I would be surprised if our adherence and food interactions and more of like that nutritional intake didn't predict it better than BMI because we know of how flawed BMI is as a measurement. Um, but for this work, um, we want with BMI is the easiest way to like stick with the model, but also collect self-reported data. But it's really based in this, this um, art interaction or HIV medication interactions. Thank you. Wonderful talk, Jake. I am curious about whether art has changed in the way that prep has changed. So it used to be so a day, now you, you know, kind of probably get it monthly. Is it monthly? Yeah, you can get monthly or bi monthly injections yeah. too now. So, so has art changed in that way? And to the extent that art has changed, what might it mean? to the research that you conducted? That's a very good question. And to answer its question, yes, art has changed. We often see that PrEP follows art in terms of like the different modalities. So there are injectable ART medications. I um, mean, in terms for relating to this work, no one has really looked at how food insecurity has impacted injectable art adherence. And I think that's a very interesting line of inquiry. Um, given that people have to go into the clinic to get their injections, um, or they can give them on their own, um, depending. So thinking about that, I think it just makes for a stronger argument to integrate support services to kind of uh, incentivize people to come to the clinic to get their medications. Um, knowing that you can get your food and your medication at the same place would probably be much better than having to take six buses to go downtown to get to the food bank and not having what they need. So I think that's another interesting line of inquiry that will add to the support for multi-level food intervention uh, and in HIV care. Excellent talk, thank you so much. Um, I'm just wondering if, so I'm thinking about people who are in cancer treatment or people living with diabetes and thinking about similar demographics in mm -hmm. the population. And I'm thinking food security might be well related to their health outcomes. I'm wondering if you would think of anything that's maybe more unique to the HIV positive population based on all the work that you've been doing. Yeah, I think um, historically and like presently, HIV continues to impact a more disenfranchised population that are more uh, prone to being housing insecure, um, have a higher likelihood of uh, just more uh, mental health comorbidities, um, which makes receiving care and engaging in care difficult from a patient who may have been relatively healthy and then have gotten a chronic uh, condition. Um, I'm hoping that one day as we move throughout the HIV epidemic, and we see it now that it's more of a chronic condition than it is like a death sentence, that we can see and we can start to integrate some of the successful interventions that we've done for like hypertension and diabetes into HIV care, because I think they're one in the same. And if we can, for people living with HIV, not only target and increase HIV care engagement and reach viral suppression, but keep them healthier, then we're ultimately supporting healthier lives down the road. Wonderful. Um, it's been wonderful year. So congratulations. Now, um, I'm gonna ask really like a one-on-one -on -one question. Uh, this <laughs> I, it just seems like a wicked problem to try to disengage from all these problems and do this. So how do you do it? That's a really good question. Um, I really think it comes down to, I think there are two ways that we can think about it. We can think about it in terms of individual clinics who are able to optimize um, engagement through providing services um, that allow them to become incentivized and engaged in care. But we can't do that without proper policy changes that allow for increased funding. So if we look at um, think about like in lieu services that allow for Medicaid beneficiaries to receive uh, uh, fresh produce as part of their medication uh, packages that are covered by Medicaid at, in states. So we really have to think about it not only is engaging clinics and telling people of the importance and building really robust programs and interventions there, but also we need the support from policymakers that allow and highlight the 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 importance of it. So. Uh, the 
like the World Health Organization and UN have highlighted that food and uh, nutrition are important aspects of HIV care, but we don't see that translated into our legislators that allow for increased funding for programs within these things. We actually see in New York State now the potential to actually cut programs, um, 340B, which would cut ancillary services such as food pantries, such as housing stuff, which is not only going to impact care engagement, but it's just going to make the poverty situation worse for people who are living with HIV and who have other chronic illnesses. So I think it's twofold, the buy-in from, from clinics and stakeholders, but also advocating with our legislators and with our policy people to increase funding because these things, we have scientific evidence that shows that these things could help increase engagement. If we can get everyone who is, vir who is living with HIV to viral suppression, then in essence, we could hopefully end the HIV epidemic. But until then, we need more funding and we need buy-in too. Um, I am wondering, I didn't see this in any of your models, but I'm wondering if it came up in your positive work with the role that social stigma about HIV and HIV treatment plays and maybe people feeling like there was dual social stigma. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So that came out. It didn't come out necessarily in study one with the patients, but it came out a lot with providers. Um, a lot of providers were saying like they don't even want to come to us to talk about their food, but they won't go out into the community because people still think you can get HIV from a toilet seat. Um, so there's just like a lot of uh, community stigma towards HIV. But then on top of it, they also are talking about they don't want to go to the food pantry because they see people see them leaving the food pantry and think that they're poor and think that they don't have money, but in, they just need help. So it's like this intersecting community norms and stigmas that not only exacerbates their HIV, but also limits their ability to get food. So that was definitely something the providers talked a lot about. Yes. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, Jake, can I, you repeat the question? Because it's hard for us to hear on Zoom. Sorry. Absolutely. Oh, can you repeat the question for me? <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> Wow, the most surprising finding uh, of this work. I think for me, um, for the the community level stigmas, I always ex expected that limited access to healthy foods would come out as a provider level, community level barrier to addressing food insecurity. But these intersecting stigmas were something that I wasn't expecting. Um, I was expecting more of the HIV stigma, but not the stigma with the food and how those compound. Um, and another interesting finding for me was the, the total 100% mediation of depression and viral non-suppression. Um, and I think that really, really supports the literature and just advocates for the need for proper mental health care for people who are living with HIV as a way to mitigate, not, all, not only to increase their engagement, but also to mitigate these like overarching uh, problems that they're facing. Is that biochemical or is that like it's the same way you kind of explain, you explained it. Yeah, so the depression is, so like food, in, so the model posits that food insecurity leads to increased mental health concerns such as depression, which reduces motivation for not only our further medication adherence, but treatment and engagement. Um, the treatment engagement is more out of like those uh, feelings of like those affect feelings of embarrassment and shame towards like telling your healthcare provider you don't have food. So instead of addressing those, they just go without their care. Um, and for the, there's a lot of research out there that shows the significant association between food insecurity and medication adherence. So that impacts the medication and then also the treatment engagement as well. A follow up question. Um, you mentioned the need for policy changes, advocate for policy changes, as well as additional funding. Is there any way to extrapolate either from the work you did or any research that's out there the number of infections averted? based on a suppressed viral. That's a really good point. So I can't uh, make any inferences from this work, but there is literature out there that shows that the majority of new infections in uh, the US are from people who are not virally suppressed. So we can see that if we get people to virally suppress, um, we probably could come up with a model that shows that. But um, that if we get people to virally suppress, then they can no longer sexually transmit the H HIV to an uninfected partner. We could entirely mitigate and reduce a significant portion of HIV infections in the US. Um, so I think that's like 
the important thing that I like to, that I see in this work is that like, we can't just think about the end goal, but we have to think about the whole step and how we get people to that end goal. And that includes engagement across all stages. So. All right. Any more questions? Last call. Jake, once again, congratulations. Thank you very much for a really engaging presentation. And he'll still be around if you have any <laughs> follow-up questions. But for now, I just want to thank everyone for attending. If you didn't sign in, please do so. And enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, excellent. Thanks, Ben. Really well.